Hello everyone, this is James Shore with another Test Driven Development episode. When we left off, we were just getting started on some code to make the rest of our application fail fast when we needed to. And um, I was sort of fumbling around. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking. I was trying to avoid making require exception its own file. Um, one of those Java peculiarities. I don't think I'm going to be able to get away with that. But maybe. Okay, so let's see. So if not expression, pro new require exception. So yeah, this is really quite straightforward. Um, and that's maybe good enough for now. Let's take a look at some of the things we need to have fail fast. We want get value at default case to be uh, let's start with this one stock market dot get year. Yeah, so if this is out of range, we need it to fail fast. Now here's the thing, I almost never write tests around my fail fast code. The fail fast code uh, is solely to tell me if, The, the fail fast code is solely to tell me about programmer errors. So I typically don't write test code around it um, because it's not production code. Now I leave it turned on in production because it can be helpful if there is a mistake, but I don't write tests around it in most cases. That's sort of a personal philosophy thing. I don't know if there's a consensus in the Agile community about the right way to do this, but personally, I don't write tests around assertions. And this fail fast code, this require statement is basically an assertion. And if the assert keyword was available or class was available, I would just use that. I'm not using Java's built-in assertion keyword though, because um, over time I build up a whole library of require methods that speak more clearly than a simple assert statement does. So. Uh, I try to make my fail fast code really, really explicit so that when something does fail, um, I can see it. And I'll probably do a desk check just to make sure it all reads clearly, but I won't write tests around it. So the test should still work. Hopefully it didn't break anything. And now, um, so if we do this, it should fail. Randix, it didn't fail for the right reason. I probably have a off by one error or something like that. Yeah. There we go. So you might think that that's a reason to put tests around this code. Eh, I still don't. This code is not strictly necessary. It is purely to inform me when I make a dumb programming mistake. Um, and of course, the program will crash eventually if I make a dumb programming mistake, but it might do it way down the road in a different part of the code. So the purpose of this fail fast is to point me to exactly what went wrong. That's why I'm so explicit in my error messages. Okay, so uh, that one's done. Need to do something similar in tax rate. Well, I think 
for this, um, we just want to make sure it's larger than one. Well, let's make it sure. Let's assert that it's larger than zero. Be nice to enforce that it's an actual. I mean, a common mistake to make here would be to put in 0.25 rather than 25. Um, but I don't want to assert that it has to be at least one because um, I could easily see a case where you might have a half percent. So Probably should do the same thing in interest rate. Okay, so there we've got that. And now for stock market table model, give value add. On um, this one's a little different. For this one, I want to have this throw a not implemented exception. I used to have um, an assertion that said something like assert dot not implemented, and other in other languages I might still do that, but in Java if it will say it, it won't work well because if you have another method throw an exception, the Java compiler doesn't know that and it will require you to return a value, which is just kind of a pain in the butt. So I'm not going to bother testing this class because um, there's not going to be anything in it. That is all there is to it. And actually, let's not call this not implemented. Let's call it unreachable code exception. So we're, we're asserting here that this code is unreachable. Uh, and if it is reached for some reason, for example, if we did that, we'll get a nice little failure. And let's have this um, tell us that. That's done. Okay, that's our fail fast. Uh, next up is doing a desk check of our spreadsheets compared to the stock market year. In order to do this, I'm going to have to put together a little spreadsheet that uh, doesn't have any of my personal confidential financial information in it. So I'm going to stop, go do that, and get back to you. Back in a moment. Okay, I'm back. Here's a uh, cleaned up version of the spreadsheet I use. Um, I actually have capital gains in here, not principal, for reasons I don't recall. Um, but this is pretty much the spreadsheet I have. Um, so let's go ahead and pull up
All right. So how does that compare? Well, the, the cumulative error at the end is $150, which is fairly substantial. The starting principle doesn't change, which is what I'd expect. We're not tracking taxable gains, um, withdrawals, available funds, uh, not tracking that. Return is not listed. Um, investment growth, that's appreciation. That is, again, there's substantial um, cumulative air there. So, but other than that, everything looks like it's working properly. So I think it's coded, all the code's working okay, but um, we've got some cumulative air. Let's see, I'm going to go ahead and save this real quick. I'll be back in a moment. Okay, I'm back. Um, I've saved that off. I, I unfortunately, I'm not going to put that into the code repository. I apologize for that, but I don't know. I mean, for one thing, it's in it's Apple's spreadsheet software called Numbers, which most of you probably can't read. Um, but also, I don't trust, I actually cut and paste that from my real spreadsheet, uh, and I don't trust that it doesn't have any of my private confidential information sort of in a buffer somewhere in that file. So I'm going to keep that to myself. Um, but so we definitely have seen that there's some error there. Um, I guess that's what we need to fix next. Let's see. I think I think the way to fix this is to uh, well the problem is this tax rate and interest rate. Uh, they both do the same thing, which is they convert dollars to integers, multiply by the rate and then uh, convert to integers again. So we're truncating substantially, and that is leading to a lot of cumulative error. Um, I think the appropriate thing to do is actually to store both the interest rate and the dollars as fixed point numbers. Um, not exactly sure how to do that, so I'm thinking that this is probably a good place to stop. I'll go off, do some research, and uh, come back to you. So uh, that's it for this episode. Uh, we're going to finish this up, fix that cumulative error problem in the next episode, and then we will get into UI again. So thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.